Okay. We can't hear you. Okay. Hi everyone, I am Nazia as a member of Team IR Students Club. I would like to welcome you all to the webinar in which the molecular genetic and clinical issues in human with inherited creating disorders will be discussed by the three distinguished speakers. The moderator of the webinar is Professor Dr. Rizkar, the president of the Hemophilia Society of Turkey. Dr. Rizkar will talk about the principles of care for women with inherited bleeding diseases. Now I, I invite Dr. Rizkar for his opening speech. Uh, hello, uh, good, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to this very, very good, very special panel, very special symposium about bleeding disorders in female. Uh, and I wanted to share my um, my speech. Okay. It is in the Nestian Ono Anna Saifadan Bulamadamama. Shanti Hajab. Keep down the Lembray. The crash for that. Is it okay? Yeah, we can see your uh, presentation. Oh, perfect. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, just I'm starting with with the uh, with my cl uh, closure. This is my declaration and conflict of interest. I didn't get uh, any support for this uh, symposium. Okay, uh, and the, this is the uh, our meeting. We have completed this year's congress and also attended the WFH Global Forum about the uh, uh, bleeding disorders, inherited ble bleeding disorders. Uh, and the, uh, bleeding is a big issue in all uh, all women around the world. Uh, you you see, it is very the difficult situation in. Uh, Asia and some uh, Latin American country and also some European countries, very important issue. Uh, and uh, 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 Dr. Zizker, Zizker, sorry to interrupt, but we don't see the movement of your slides. Oh, sorry. Sorry, it is in my but uh, there is no any uh, documents. Am I right? Yeah. No, no, not yet. This is uh, the. Uh, Miss uh, Ergil, could you start before me, and uh, and then I I, I I I wanted to start uh, to solve my problem. Uh, but but if you like, you can send your presentation to me by email, and I can share oh, it for you. Okay, I, I'm sending it to you. Sure. All right. Mm -hmm. Because this is not the same program, it's a yeah. program, but it couldn't, uh, the team program needs, uh, yeah, I send it, no, uh, oh. it's, it's an ongoing procedure.
these technical problems happen uh, during, during yeah. the online meetings. So. Okay, it, it's gone. I haven't received it yet, but. Uh... Okay, it, it, it will be in, in, in your desktop. Yeah, but I haven't received your mail yet. Uh, probably it will take a few seconds to. It, yeah, it's our PowerPoint presentation. It needs uh, some time to to, uh, mm -hmm. to arrive. <laughs> it takes time. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I will. I I'm sure I will get it soon. Okay, have you seen, is it okay? Sorry, not but yet. Uh, not yet. <laughs> uh, maybe I should go ahead and... Uh, for the time, huh, okay, I received it. Please. So I, I am going to share it very soon. Please. Uh, I will say the next or wait or to to to. For the all right, so can you see the yeah, okay, perfect, presentation. perfect. Thank you very much, the, the, uh, uh, Miss, Miss uh, Berber. Uh, I, I'm just starting again. Please look for women with inherited bleeding disorders. Uh, second, second. Th th Okay, second slide. Sorry. All right. Okay, please. Uh, could you could you could you could you enlarge it? Okay. Enlarge. Okay, sorry. Is that okay oh, now? Perfect. This is the, my declaration, my conflict of interest. I I did not I I did not any support from any company. This uh, next. The uh, I, I want. Uh, this is the our co congress announcement. I've just completed the. Uh, Congress and also uh, attended the WFH Global Forum. This is related to the inherited bleeding disorders. Next, please. Uh, bleeding is a big issue in all of all women around the world, uh, in Asia and some Latin country and also some uh, European country has a, uh, has, has a this problem uh, all over the world. Uh, next. Uh, 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 now, uh, there are around 18 million women who suffer from menorrhagia, uh, 10 to 15 women of, uh, out of uh, 100 women uh, experience menorrhagia. It's thought that uh, 2 or 3 million women who have menorrhagia have underlying bleed disorders. Some example of uh, abnormal uterine bleeding is intermenstrual inter bleeding, excessive bleeding, at ovulation and more. Next, please. Uh, there are two main causes of the abnormal uterine bleeding, organic and non-organic causes, uh, this two group. Uh, coagulopathy is one of the, uh, the, the non-organic causes. Uh, next, please. Uh, coagulopathy is seen uh, mostly, in, in, uh, mostly in inherited bleeding disorders like uh, uh, von Willebrand disorders, the, the biggest group is the von Willebrand disorders, uh, in, uh, w uh, mostly women and also some male uh, uh, person has a von Willebrand disorder. The second biggest group is hemophilia carriers. The third group uh, is uh, platelet function disorders, such as Glanzmann thrombasthenia, Bernard-Soulier syndrome, and others. The, the last one is the rare factor deficiency, rare bleeding disorders. Uh, for example, fibronigen deficiency, factor 2, factor 5, factor 7, factor 10, factor 11, and also factor 13 deficiency. deficiency. There are some combined factor deficiency. And we know there are other groups for uh, uh, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, uh, like that. Uh, next, please. 
Around the world, uh, there are more than uh, 76,000 uh, people with Womili Brandt and more than 42,000 people uh, with uh, other breathing uh, disorders who are uh, diagnosed. Uh, this is the uh, end of the year 2018 uh, registered patient in uh, World Federation of Hemophilia. And I wanted to give the Turkish data. Please, next slide. Uh, uh, in Turkey, uh, uh, this is the, our year 2015 uh, the registered uh, documents. Uh, th there are more than 2,000 uh, or 2,200 people with uh, rare factor deficiency and also platelet function disorders, and also uh, more than 1,200 uh, uh, von Willebrand disorders. And also, we know the the, the exact number or uh, exact number is more than the, 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 this uh, the, the, more than this because there are uh, unregistered patients, especially in Mumbai brand disorders. Next, please. Uh, bleeding can cause some consequences like pain during uh, during periods and also anemia, mostly uh, iron deficiency anemia. And also, uh, it, the limitation their uh, daily activity and uh, reduced of quality of life uh, and psychosocial uh, adverse effect uh, and much more uh, problem they have. Next, please. Uh, some symptoms for bleeding in von Willebrand disease are menorrhagia, gum bleeding, at, uh, and also others. Uh, if, if, if you cannot determine the bleeding in women, the quality of life is reduced significantly, and we cannot uh, co control the bleeding during the surgery. Next, please. Uh, evaluation for the suspected bleeding disorders in female uh, can be from personal and family history of bleeding sign and symptoms, uh, medication history, for example, con contraceptive, anticoagulant, uh, or antiplatelet uh, medicine, uh, and uh, also clinical and gynecological uh, tests are very important. Trauma or polar is very important, and also uh, bleeding tests such as BAT tests uh, very important, and also. Uh, laboratory assessment, uh, very important. Next, please. Uh, lab some laboratory tests that can be used uh, in, in the, during the diagnosis and also uh, uh, follow during the follow-up. Uh, first one is the complete blood count. Uh, the, the second one is the uh, prothrombin time, activated partial uh, thromboplastin time, fibronogen, uh, and also von Willebrand factor activities and, and von Willebrand factor uh, antigen and also factor eight assays are very important and also platelet function tests are very important such as platelet, platelet aggregation studies and platelet glycoprotein expression are very important and also if we determine the rare factor deficiency we should look at the we should uh, examine uh, study with the factor five factor seven factor nine factor Factor 11 and also the others. Uh, of course, the uh, actual uh, machine are used in this in this test is thromboelastogram and also in uh, thrombin generation tests are very important. Next, please. But actually, the real uh, life is not very easy for the determine of the uh, fa fa factor uh, von Willebrand factor level. Uh, there are many uh, factors that affect the von Willebrand factor levels. Some are ABI blood type, age, race, menstrual cycle, pregnancy, and the other systemic difficulties, systemic disease, such as malignancies and inflammation and uh, postoperative period uh, are very important for the, for the, the it's very, uh, their effect are very important for von Willebrand factor level. Next, please. Uh, for diagnosis uh, with genetic tests, there are two steps you can follow. In the first step, you can find the potential bleeding and von Willebrand factor 11 and the family background. Uh, and the second step, uh, multimeric and uh, analysis, uh, collagen binding ability, the factor levels, ristocetin induced 
platelet agglutination, agglutination and also intraplatelet counts. Uh, this show us uh, genetic analysis. Uh, we need genetic analysis for to, to have the correct diagnosis. Next, please. Because we know the leading disorders are inherited by family and continuous with dominant and recessive uh, autosomal gene. And we will listen this uh, this session, these details by uh, uh, my colleagues who will present their, their, present, their presentation. Next, please. Uh, this is the treatment uh, protocol. This is the, uh, it's important uh, to diagnose menorrhagia and to treat at the right time with the right product, such as hemostatic agents, platelet transfusion, plasma, and, all. and also prophylaxis are very, very important to prevent heavy uh, menstrual bleeding to pre uh, during the pregnancy, during the delivery, uh, like that. Uh, next, please. Uh, these are the products which, uh, which are currently available in Turkey. Uh, many plasma drugs factors and recombinant uh, factors and also some factor eight mimetics. Uh, uh, but for, for, uh, for inherited bleeding disorder in women, we use mostly uh, the hematope uh, for, for long livrant factor deficiency and hemocompletan for, for uh, factor one or uh, uh, fibronogen deficiency, and also there are some complex product, uh, COFAC and Cascadil contains factor five, factor 10, factor 11, and also we know we have the factor 13 uh, pro product. Uh, uh, next, please. Uh, we also have worked, uh, studied, uh, and our experience with von Willebrand disease in surgical intervention and treatments. Uh, as a conclusion, next slide is, uh, is uh, to di diagnose and treat uh, females with von Willebrand disorders, it's important to have a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, the diagnosis should be made uh, as, as early as possible uh, during the bleeding in pubertal stage. Uh, necessary factor uh, concentrate should be used uh, and in case of an ongoing bleeding, Early prophylaxis should be used. Also, uh, genetic analyses are important for early and acquired uh, diagnosis, as well as the right uh, prospective study uh, to protect uh, the mother and the baby during the childbirth. Uh, and, uh, and the last slide is uh, the next one. Uh, thank you very much to, to have a chance to give the uh, uh, entrance to the very special topics. Uh, thank you. Aral University and Turkish Mobilia Society. We thank you very much for sparing your time for us and uh, for sharing your experience with us. Now, I, uh, I uh, the questions are scheduled to the end of the sp uh, webinar, so maybe we can proceed with the next uh, speaker and Ulash will introduce the next speaker. I thank you, Dr. Zülfikar. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Ulash as the principal of Jin Aral Student Club. Uh, I welcome you all to the webinar. The second speaker is Professor Dr. Ergül Berber. We talk about the importance of the genetic counseling to fight with the inherited bleeding disorders and its importance for women. She is from Aral University, head of the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics. She has been investigating the molecular pathology of inherited bleeding disorders. And now I invite Dr. Berber for her speech. Thank you, Ulaş. So I am going to talk about the impact of genetic counseling on inherited bleeding diseases by emphasizing its importance for women. So as Dr. Zilfikar mentioned, uh, the most common bleeding disorders are family brand disease in the first place, and then hemophilia A and B, and then rare bleeding diseases. And they are the, uh, associated with the deficiency of the uh, factors involved in the primary hemostasis or the coagulation factors. Family brand disease is associated with deficiency of family brand factor, and uh, the gene coding for from family brand factor is located on chromosome 12. Hem hemophilia A and B are associated with the 
deficiency of factor eight or factor nine respectively, and the gene coding for these factors are located side by side on X chromosome. And uh, most of the family brand cases are inherited, and there's evidence of family history of excessive bleeding. And because the gene is an autosomal gene, both males and females are affected. And uh, except type 2 and form of type 2 formula brand disease and type 3 formula formula brand disease, formula brand disease is an autosomal dominant trait. Uh, in the case of type 2 formula brand disease and type 3 formula brand disease, which is autosomal recessive, uh, type 2 and then type 3 formula brand disease, which are autosomal recessive, parents usually do not manifest, manifest the clinical symptoms and they are carriers. In the case of hemophilia A or B, uh, the diseases are associated uh, are inherited as X-linked recessive diseases, and uh, because of the presence of a single X chromosome, only males are affected. Women are carrier. Women are carriers, and uh, they have reduced levels, uh, reduced factor levels. They may have, and here we have to uh, uh, know that the female carriers may be symptomatic as well. Are they familial all the time? No, there are unfamilial cases of hemophilia, hemophilia and uh, family brand disease. Uh, they, there are acquired hemophilia A or acquired family brand disease. In these cases, the individual developed a disease later in life and they do not have the mutation in either factor eight or family brand uh, factor gene. And the other uh, non-familial form of the bleeding disease is sporadic cases. And uh, as you see in the pedigree uh, given here, only the patient in the family uh, is the individual in the family carrying the mutated gene. And he's the first one in the family to be affected. But again here, uh, not only for hemophilia, for all genetic diseases, it is important to remember that any individual can born with a de novo mutation. And the proportion of uh, de novo cases for family brand disease is not known yet, but uh, it, it is predicted that approximately 30% of the hemophilia cases are sporadic. And uh, in the case of sporadic hemophilia, the mother may not be carrier, or it, she's the carrier with genotypically normal parents, or she's a carrier who has inherited the mutation from her mother. However, there is not always a clear cut between the, the carrier study of the mother of a sporadic cases. Uh, the situation may be complicated because of the mosaism. And here's an example for the mosaism uh, in a family reported by Costa and his friends uh, in two, 2009. So here, this is a sporadic family. This individual is the first one in the family having the mutation. And the genetic analysis revealed that she has he has a mutation in the factor eight gene, causing premature stop uh, in the translation process. And uh, when they check the DNA isolated from the blood uh, tissue of the mother, they uh, found out that she is carrier. Because she is carrier, the uh, they wanted to check the possibility that the grandmother is also carrier, and they did the gen genetic test on the blood DNA of the grandmother, but she was normal. She didn't have the mutation. These uh, findings can suggest two things. Either a de novo germline mutation in one of the grandparents have, uh, had occurred, or a de novo somatic mutation early during em embryogenesis in the mother has occurred. Several years uh, later, this aunt had, had to have a surgical operation, and she had excessive bleeding, and they checked her DNA for the presence of the mutation uh, of the patient uh, of the prevent here, and she was the she was also carrier for the mutation. And uh, the presence of the same mutation in the two sister first suggests that the grandmother was a carrier with a somatic mosaism. So the, in order to explore this, uh, they checked the DNA isolated from different tissues. On, uh, in the grandmother, but she was normal for all these tissues. She didn't have the mutation. And then they uh, checked the, the genetic state of the completely normal, healthy father, and they find out that 
he has the mutation, but his factor eight level is uh, normal. And this uh, example demonstrates the mosaism in the asymptomatic maternal grandfather of a hemophilia A patient. So during genetic counseling, all these uh, situations should be considered. Who are carriers? Uh, because familial brain disease is, is an autosomal trait, uh, men and uh, females, males and females are can be carriers. And because hemophilia is an excellent linked disorder, and recessive X-linked recessive disorder. Only females can uh, are carriers, and the carriers in the case of hemophilia can uh, is either a mother of an affected male or daughter of an affected father. They are uh, obligate carriers, uh, or they can be sister of an affected male. Whether it is an uh, autosomal recessive or X-linked recessive, it doesn't matter. Carriers have a 25% chance of having an affected child in each pregnancy. Therefore, in order to fight with the uh, congenital bleeding disorders, uh, it is important to identify carriers. Uh, identification of carriers are important not only for the carrying carrier woman because the carrier woman have an increased risk for bleeding during pregnancy and delivery, but also managing the bleeding tendency of the mother and also for uh, the bleeding tendency of the child with a potential bleeding disorder. We can identify carriers uh, by calculating the probability for carriership based on pedigree analysis, or we can perform genetic testing, which is more accurate method for detecting the carriers. And all carriers, uh, of congenital bleeding diseases should offer qualifi qualified assistance in genetic information, genetic testing, and counseling to help them to cope with the psychological and ethical problems related to carriership of a genetic disorder. Therefore, genetic counseling uh, for the congenital bleeding diseases should encompass the issues of carrier testing and prenatal diagnosis. But once the carriers are identified, this maximizes the risk assessment. And also, it helps the carriers because they be, they get uh, they can uh, make their informed de decisions easily. Uh, as I indicated in the beginning of my talk, mo uh, most of the case of the hemophilia is this is sporadic. So most of the uh, most of the carriers or carrier couples they do not they do not know the, they are carrier. Therefore, they are unaware of their reproductive risk. So, uh, therefore, in, uh, identifying the carriers um, via uh, screening uh, enhance their reproductive autonomy. As a result, they can make informed decisions. And in, at this point, uh, carriers or carrier couples have two options. They can either utilize pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or prenatal diagnosis to avoid having an affected child, or they can conceive naturally and they can pre they can get ready for the birth of a potentially affected child and initiate treatment in the newborn period. Uh, and all carriers should be offered genetic counseling because they are at, at risk of delivering an affected child, as I indicated. And uh, the best time for genetic counseling is the before is before pregnancy, but if the woman is pregnant and the genetic counseling should be applied during pregnancy, it should be available as early as possible. Here is the algorithm used for the management of carriers or possible carriers. So the, the before the pregnancy, genetic counseling is uh, applied and during genetic counseling, the uh, individuals or carriers are informed about the genetic testing options. And if they uh, consent on getting uh, genetic testing, and with this genetic testing, if they are uh, demonstrated to be not carrier, then there is no problem. Uh, everything is perfect. But if their carriership is proven by genetic testing, or they are obligate carriers, then genetic counseling should be applied, and the individual's carriers should be informed on management of pregnancy and delivery and the prenatal diagnosis plan. And during pregnancy, there are two options. Uh, prenatal diagnostic testing can be applied with the intention of termination, 
or prenatal diagnostic testing for the management can be applied. And here, uh, the sex of the baby or the genetic state of the baby is important. And genetic counseling help patients, carriers, and families understand the diagnosis and its implications. And as a result, genetic counseling ultimately help affected individuals to adjust to living with the condition. Particularly, it is important for the reproductive choices of people uh, who have hemophilia or they are uh, who are carriers. Also, genetic counseling helps to proactively prepare for the possibility of having a child with hemophilia. Sorry. So the genetic counseling for genet congenital bleeding diseases should also encompass the issue of risk to family members. Here is the algorithm you can, that can be used to, to determine the risk to SIPs in autosomal dominant family brand disease. I won't go into detail, but because it is an autosomal dominant disease, if a parent is affected, we should know that the risk to the SIPs is 50%. And uh, we should know that the offspring of the proband is also under risk because they have a 50% chance of inheriting the VWF gene mutation. This is the algorithm for the SIP to determine the risk to SIPs in autosomal recessive family brand disease. Again, if both parents are carriers, there's 25% chance of being affected. But if no parent is carrier, then there's no risk of of having an affected child unless it is sporadic. And the offspring of the proband here is obligate carriers for the VWF gene mutation. And uh, the risk to family members of hemophilia changes with the situation in the family. So if, in, for if there's an, just an affected parent, a father in the family, then there's no risk for the boys, in, uh, but there's the daughters are 100% carriers. But uh, in, in a family in which the mother is carrier and the father is healthy, then there's 50% chance that the uh, boys are affected and there's 50% chance that the daughters will be carriers. And in such a family in which the father is affected and the mother is carrier, there is a 50% chance that the um, boys are affected and there is 50% chance that the daughters will be carriers and 50% chance that the daughters will be affected. And this is the situation that we usually see in the case of consanguinity. So the uh, proper genetic counseling should get a, should uh, um, uh, should have all these steps. It should uh, the uh, provider, genetic counseling provider, should be able to uh, get information from the patient, clinical and non-clinical information, and should be able to educate individuals uh, about uh, to help them in their decision-making process related to a diagnosis of hemophilia or carrier, and they uh, they should be able to uh, do the risk assessment. Sorry. and determine the inheritance for the patient and the family uh, by synthesizing the information he gets from the family. And they should, he should be able to uh, give information about the reproductive choice of people uh, who have the hemophilia or their carriers. They, uh, the provider should be able to give information about the potential results and implication on genetic testing. And also the uh, provider should be able to provide uh, psychosocial assessment and counseling because at the end, uh, the patient uh, or the carrier should feel supported and free to express feelings, discuss concerns and reach their own informed decision. Uh, the Genetic counseling has been uh, recognized in developing countries where consanguinity is high or is uh, is a part of integral part of social and cultural life. Uh, because consanguinity in a family with a history of genetic disease increases the chance of having an affected children. And in these families, genetic counseling can minimize complications and present options for reducing the impact on offspring by using risk assessment. And genetic counseling can also address the psychosocial needs, concerns, and fears of the individuals impacted. 
In some cultures, mar marriages are arranged by the head of the family. And uh, in these cases, there may be concerns around disclosing whether a daughter is a carrier or potential carrier of hemophilia uh, for fear that no suitable alliance will be forthcoming or that having a child with a disability could lead her to be rejected by her in-laws. However, uh, for, for the males, there's no, there's no such concerns. A male with hemophilia may find a partner without much difficulty. So here's an example. There, uh, in this family, uh, was uh, in this family, father was uh, was affected by severe hemophilia A, and the daughter uh, was uh, she had difficulties understanding and accepting the her obligate carrier statue, and the mother was very much concerned about her daughter, and she took her to the physician of the father, and the physician of the father asked if the daughter would be willing to speak to the, to a genetic counselor, and then. Uh, during the session, the daughter disclosed that she was most concerned with how and when she should disclose this information to her future husband. And at, uh, at the session, genetic counselor was able to talk through his concern with the daughter, this concern with the daughter, and help her to develop a plan with which she was comfortable. And after this session, the daughter was more open to accepting her carrier statue and pursuing further evaluation for herself by a hematologist. So uh, in conclusion, uh, increased awareness of diagnosis, treatment and support for hemophilia worldwide has led to increased recognition for genetic counseling within this disease. And uh, recent advances uh, in genetic testings and the uh, worldwide availability of genetic testings ensure a firm place for genetics in the management of hemophilia through and also in the case of other bleeding disorders through genetic counseling, carrier detection and reproductive management. Genetic counseling is a complex process, but it is essential for the comprehensive care for patients and families. And because genetic counseling focuses on educating patients or families about the clinical presentation, underlying genetics and familial implications of bleeding diseases, and uh, genetic counselors provide a supportive environment for the individuals to explore the information, to make informed decisions and work through evoked feelings and emotions. So uh, I am finishing my talk here and I wish you all very happy new year uh, and in the new year, let me finish it, okay. Thank you, Dr. Berber. I am Mishra as the General Secretary of the Naya Student Club. I would like to introduce you the lead speaker, Professor Dr. Paola James. She will talk about the molecular pathology of bleeding diseases and advance in the molecular genetic diagnosis of inherited bleeding diseases. She is the principal investigator in the clinical and molecular hemostasis research group at Queen's University. Investigating the genetic basis of inherited bleeding disorders, as well as the quantitation of bleeding symptoms. Now I invite Dr. James to give her speech. Thank you very much. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, and I'm gonna share my slides. And can you see my slides? Yes, perfect. Okay, great, great. So thank you very much for the invitation to present today. It's a, a pleasure to be co-presenting in a session with my friend and colleague, Dr. Berber, and um, a pleasure to meet Dr. Zulfikar and all of you as well. Um, today, I'm gonna be talking about um, predominantly about Villebrand's disease and issues that women in particular face with this disorder, um, and then give a clinical scenario where genetic testing um, can be helpful. Uh, these are my disclosures. I've got 
um, research funding from a few companies that manufacture von Willebrand factor containing concentrates. And so just to start with a bit of a background um, about von Willebrand disease, this was originally described by Dr. Eric von Willebrand in 1926. Uh, and he looked after a young woman who lived in a fairly remote part of the world um, and had significant issues with bleeding and unfortunately died at the time of her fourth menstrual period because of, of hemorrhage. And he called this condition pseudohemophilia because he recognized that it seemed to be inherited like hemophilia, which had been described the century before, but that there were some differences um, as well. And so what we understand now is that VWD is caused by quantitative or qualitative abnormalities of von Willebrand factor. Um, historically, the prevalence of von Willebrand's disease is quoted to be about one in a hundred. Maybe a little bit of an overcall. Um, if you take a look at individuals who have symptomatic bleeding, it's more like about one in a thousand, which still makes this the most common inherited bleeding disorder that, that we know about. As we've heard, it's inherited autosomally, uh, and so inherited equally between males and females, but we do diagnose females more commonly because of the gynecologic and obstetrical bleeding complications that the disease causes. And so most patients with BWD experience excessive mucocutaneous bleeding, but we do see musculoskeletal bleeding or bleeding into muscles and, and joints in the most severely affected individuals. So this is the classification from ISTH for BWD, uh, type one, which is a mild or moderate reduction in BWF, type two, which is a group of functional variants, and then type three, uh, which is a severe quantitative trait. There was a recent update made to this classification um, by the ISTH BWF SSC to add in type 1C, uh, which is increased BWF clearance and looks similar to regular type 1 BWD in that it's a mild or moderate quantitative trait. Um, and as we've already heard, the inheritance, although autosomal, um, is dominant in the types above the line and recessive uh, in 2N and type 3. So to present a clinical case, um, this is a 29-year-old woman who presents to her family physician with heavy periods. Um, they occur monthly, last 8 to 10 days. The heaviest bleeding is on the second and third day. And she suffers from flooding, particularly when she stands and is having difficulty with accidents at work. She's been iron deficient since she was a teenager. And when a more detailed bleeding history is taken, it turns out there's a fair bit of other bleeding that's happened to this young woman as well, that she had significant bleeding after wisdom teeth extraction, uh, required resuturing, uh, nosebleeds that required multiple visits to the emergency room for cautery, she bruises easily, her gums bleed when she brushes or flosses. Unfortunately, this young woman doesn't know her family history because she was adopted. And also, unfortunately, she had sought medical attention for her periods, but had been told that this kind of bleeding was normal. Uh, and so an important takeaway for this lecture is that you recognize that this is absolutely not normal. And so heavy menstrual bleeding is a common problem. We heard some of these figures um, from Professor Zulfikar. And so it is the most common presenting symptom of an underlying bleeding disorder. And the percentage of women that suffer from heavy menstrual bleeding at some point during their reproductive years varies depending on the papers that you read, but is a significant proportion for sure. And fully... 15 to 30 percent of those with heavy menstrual bleeding have an underlying inherited bleeding disorder. So this is a really important symptom for um, us to be aware of. 
and it causes a huge impact. Um, Two thirds of hysterectomies and reproductive years are done because of heavy menstrual bleeding, many of which could be avoided with appropriate management. It causes iron deficiency anemia, uh, causes women to miss school and work and leads to a poor quality of life. And so a huge problem facing women with underlying bleeding disorders is under and delayed diagnosis. And so if we take a look at the Canadian numbers, uh, we predict based on that one in a thousand that there would be close to 38,000 affected Canadians with BWD. But if we look into our registry and similar to the Turkish registry, not everybody is registered, but there are currently 8,000 individuals um, registered. And I think undoubtedly that means that there are thousands, um, if not tens of thousands, who are undiagnosed. And I would be willing to bet that the majority of those are women. Um, and there have been a number of studies that have looked at this and women face a significant delay in diagnosis and they can wait up to 15 years from the onset of bleeding symptoms to getting a diagnosis. And that's despite a similar age um, of the first bleed when compared to men. And it's also despite the fact that treatment requirements seem very similar between um, women and men. And so there's something bad and unfortunate that's happening um, that's leading to specific delays in women. Um, and I already alluded to this, but I think this is a major problem um, because the quality of life in women with VWD can be significantly reduced. And there's a, a number of papers that show this, one of which shows that the quality of life of a woman with VWD who's iron deficient and has heavy menstrual bleeding is probably poorer than an HIV positive man with hemophilia. And I think this has been overlooked in terms of its impact on an individual's health and, and on society um, in general. So I, I want to move to talk about why does this happen? Why do women go undiagnosed? And then what advances have been made to try to address these issues? And so I'm going to focus the talk around these three issues. Um, the first is that I think that there's an unfortunate lack of understanding of normal versus abnormal bleeding, particularly when it comes to gynecologic and obstetric bleeding. There's a stigma against open discussion about menstrual periods, about postpartum bleeding. And it's very common that women don't know what's normal and what's abnormal. And unfortunately, like in that clinical case, even if they seek medical attention, might be told that something that's profoundly abnormal is normal. Um, I think we've done a poor job historically of teaching um, medical students and scientists about this. Um, women's health has been historically underfunded. Um, there's been a lack of resources and tools as well. And one of the challenges that has to be acknowledged is that uterine bleeding is normal. Um, the kinds of bleeding symptoms that men get bleeding into joints, for example, is abnormal. So there's no question um, if that happens that that requires additional investigation and diagnosis and management. But when we're talking about a physiologic kind of bleeding, um, we need better approaches to determine how much is normal and when does it become abnormal. Another issue for um, diagnosis, this isn't particular to women, but certainly affects them, is that the lab tests are challenging and not widely available. And historically, we have argued about how to diagnose VWD, what are the diagnostic cutoffs, and how to best manage um, these patients. And so I'm going to go through all of these and talk about what's being done to address each of them. But I do explicitly want to call this out. Um, and I, I think I've been implying this a bit with what I've been talking about. But we absolutely have a problem um, when it comes to women and bleeding disorder with issues around sexism and women's health issues being under recognized um, and dismissed. And I think this is important to recognize so that we can make improvements. 
So uh, to move on more optimistically to things that are being done to try to address these challenges. So there's been a great deal of work done on bleeding assessment tools, uh, which are questionnaires that help clinicians standardize a bleeding history and quantitate the bleeding symptoms so that it's easy to tell is the amount of bleeding that this person has reported to me normal or abnormal. And I'll, I'll show you um, the bleeding score, um, which is the product of using a bleeding assessment tool for that clinical case um, in a few minutes. Bleeding assessment tools have been shown to be very effective screening tools uh, for VWD. And so they're very helpful in picking up women who have underlying an underlying bleeding disorder. Um, there are a number of iterations of bleeding assessment tools, but one that I want to bring to your attention is our self-administered bleeding assessment tool. Um, this is freely available to anybody who's interested on our Let's Talk period website that we launched a number of years ago. The website um, has been pretty active since we launched it with hundreds of thousands of page views and tens of thousands of people who've taken the self bet. And so I think there really is an appetite out there uh, for people to access appropriate and accurate information and also to have a tool that can help them interpret their own bleeding symptoms. If you take this self bet on our website at the end, you actually get a readout. Is your bleeding score normal or abnormal with a printout that you could take to see your physician or um, nurse to discuss your bleeding symptoms? And as I mentioned, particularly in adult women, we know that a positive bleeding score is an excellent screening tool for VWD um, with very, very high sensitivity but also a very strong negative predictive value, meaning that if you have a normal bleeding score as an adult woman, the chance that you have von Willebrand disease is exceedingly low. I think there have been a number of other initiatives to address this stigma around women's particular issues when it comes to bleeding disorders. So Code Rouge is a Canadian conference focused on um, women and bleeding disorders. WFH, the World Federation of Hemophilia, um, holds specific conferences focused on women and girls. The Canadian Hemophilia Society has done a number of initiatives. And I want to acknowledge the session that's happening today. Uh, earlier in my career, I never would have been asked to speak about um, these issues, even though I was seeing them in my clinic every day. And so I want to um, applaud your group for calling attention um, to these issues, which are so very important. We've heard a little bit um, already about diagnosing VWD. Um, there's a series of tests that we need to do in the clinical laboratory. Um, those above the line could be considered screening tests, and those below the line are confirmatory tests. These are tricky assays that require a high level of expertise. Um, and I, I'm going to focus a little bit on genetic testing, just given the group I'm speaking to today. Um, this is the VWF gene, which we've heard is on uh, chromosome 12, uh, 178 KB of genomic sequence um, with uh, a VWF mRNA of 8.7 KB. There's a pseudogene um, with about 97% homology to the VWF gene um, from exons 23 to 34. And that requires when you're sequencing VWF, um, careful choice of primers and conditions so that you're sequencing the gene and not the pseudogene. Genetic testing for von Willebrand's disease can be helpful in specific circumstances. So, this is um, VWF along the x-axis here. And you can see the location of the disease-causing variants um, along the protein um, with the type or subtype that they've been identified in, shown in colors. And a couple of points to make are that the mutations that cause type 1 and type 3 are the quantitative variants are, are really located throughout the VWF gene. Those that cause the type 2 variants or the functional variants are much more localized to specific functional domains of the protein. Um, and it does make genetic testing 
for type 2 easier because there's a smaller part of the gene that you need to take a look at. If we take a look at how commonly we find an underlying mutation or pathogenic variant, it's less common in type 1, uh, more common in type 2 and type 3, starting to get to the level of what we find if we do genetic testing for hemophilia A and hemophilia B. And then just to talk about that third point that I raised, uh, a lack of consensus on how we diagnose and manage BWD. A number of organizations recognized this and have recognized this as a concern. And so these are the first international guidelines that have been published on the diagnosis and management of VWD in January of 2020, of 2021. Um, there are two papers, one focused on the diagnosis and one focused on management. And just to summarize what happened um, with those panels, for diagnosis, every diagnostic recommendation that we made prioritizes not missing affected patients. Um, and as I've already talked about, those are predominantly women. And so there are recommendations in support of the use of BATS, bleeding assessment tools, recommendations that outline the assays that should be used and what diagnostic thresholds we should use, and then recommendations in support of genetic testing. For management, there are a series of recommendations covering the use of prophylaxis, major and minor surgery, and then an entire section focused on women's issues. So how do we manage heavy menstrual bleeding, what to do about epidural anesthesia and labor, and then how to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. And so this is a major step forward, um, but an important limitation that I have to acknowledge is that out of the 23 recommendations that we made on the diagnosis and management of VWD, only three of them are strong. Um, we used the GRADE methodology, so these are evidence-based recommendations. And in most cases, we had low quality evidence. And so additional research and funding needs to be dedicated to VWD so that over time, these recommendations can become stronger. So just to finish off by returning to the clinical case, so that bleeding history that I outlined for you, um, that results in a bleeding score of 11. Um, in an adult woman, anything greater than six is abnormal. So this is an abnormal or positive bleeding score. This patient had blood work and that showed that she is anemic. Uh, her hemoglobin is 102. The bottom end of the normal range um, is 120. So mild to moderate anemia. But also there's a thrombocytopenia present. So a platelet count of 120 where the bottom end of the normal range is 150. And she's iron deficient. Uh, the PT and APTT are normal. So her family physician started her on iron supplementation, thankfully, and referred her to hematology. And when she was seen there, because she had been on iron supplementation, there was an improvement in her hemoglobin, but she remained um, thrombocytopenic. And her VWD testing showed um, a VWF antigen of 0.25. The bottom end of the normal range is 0 0.50, so a low VWF level with a significantly reduced VWF function. And in our lab, we're using an assay called the GP1BM right now. Um, and you can see that the function is much lower than the level of protein, suggesting there's some kind of a qualitative problem here. The multimers are abnormal in this patient and genetic testing revealed a missense mutation at amino acid 1316 of alien to methionine, which is a classic mutation that we see in type 2B VWD. And 2B is a gain of function situation um, where the VWF, which normally <coughs> does not bind to platelets in the circulation, has an increased affinity for platelets. And that's why the patient's platelet count was reduced. Although we use desmopressin to treat many VWD patients. Uh, we would not use it for 2B VWD. Uh, it's relatively contraindicated because it can make the thrombocytopenia worse. Patient was started on tranexamic acid, which is uh, a medication that helps with periods. And follow-up was arranged for her in a combined clinic uh, between gynecology and hematology. We discussed with her when to call us or present to the emergency room. 
for treatment with von Willebrand factor concentrate like humate P. And within a few months, um, she was actually feeling much better, improved energy and concentration. Periods had shortened in duration. And so I hope I've communicated today that the accurate diagnosis of a bleeding disorder is very important for everybody who's affected. Um, but I've highlighted the issues facing women. I think there's value in bleeding assessment tools. We need high quality lab assays and we need higher quality research on which to base strong recommendations going forward. And I think a really important takeaway is that VWD is not difficult to treat. It requires some expertise to diagnose, um, but it is very possible to improve quality of life for these patients. Uh, and that's really the ultimate goal. And so I want to acknowledge um, all of the people who I work with and um, the funding agencies for some of the work I've presented. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm very happy to take questions. And I'm going to try to stop sharing. Thanks. There we go. Did that work? Nazma? Nazma? Thank you for the excellent talk again. But um, we can't hear you well. Can you make the microphone close to your... Uh, it's okay now? Yeah. Okay, thank you for the excellent talk, Ms. James. And um, now I think we can get the uh, uh, questions from my friends. Any questions? Is there, yes. Is there anybody? Some uh, Paula, thank you for this excellent talk. I, uh, from your talk and from Dr. Zufiker's talks, I see that the bleeding uh, is an important issue worldwide. It doesn't matter whether it's a developing country or a developed country. Yep. And it is kept as a secret. Secret. Yep. yep. And, uh, and we should... I believe that, and this is the reason that I invited you and Dr. Zulfikar to this webinar, because when uh, I was working with factor 11 yeah. deficient patients, we, I saw that most of them had uh, mothers who are carriers, but they were asymptomatic, or I don't know, maybe they kept it as a secret, they were symptomatic. So yeah. we should uh, raise the awareness in this issue because each bleeding woman is a potential carrier and the identification of the carriers are important to decrease the mortality and morbidity rate of these congenital bleeding dis diseases. And uh, from the meetings that I attend, I uh, see that families are highly dependent on the gene therapy uh, developments. Uh, but what would you think? Which one is better? The, the, the treating the patients or uh, identifying the carriers or identifying the care, uh, bleeding woman? Well, I think it's all important. And there's a lot of treatment that's widely available and effective that's not nearly as complicated as gene therapy. Even just iron replacement therapy in a woman who has um, heavy menstrual bleeding and the use of tranexamic acid, which is a available worldwide and is a relatively inexpensive treatment, not everywhere, but it is widely available and a very effective treatment and much simpler than undergoing gene therapy. And so I think for the quality of life of those patients, doing simple things is really important. The combined oral contraceptive pill is something that we use quite often for the management of heavy menstrual bleeding. Again, something that may not always be acceptable um, as a form of contraception, but it is, is at least available um, worldwide. And I just wanted to pick up on a point you made about, um, an important point you made about the global nature of these diseases and developed countries and developing countries. The guidelines that I quoted for you, the ASH VWD guidelines, they actually took the perspective of a high resource state deliberately but we are actually right now in discussion with ASH about adapting them for low and middle income countries because it may not be possible for someone to have access to all of the sophisticated diagnosis, for example, that we 
suggest in that paper that we recommend. So that work is underway and I think is really important because even with limited lab testing facilities, for example, you still can make a difference. Um, you know, a ferritin, which diagnoses iron deficiency is an easy test, very, very widely available. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Zülfikar, uh, in, the, in, in the population, people think that the cancer is more uh, prevalent or more serious disease. But uh, like I, I believe that these rare diseases, bleed, uh, bleeding diseases, are also very uh, common. What would you think of this? Uh, the, the, uh, Dr. Weber, it's a very important issue. Uh, I, I pointed out there are two reasons of the uh, bleeding. One is the organic, uh, the other one is the, the uh, non-organic uh, etiology. Uh, organic etiology consists of the malignancy and the others, but we know uh, the inherited bleeding disorders is very important issue in this. Uh, every uh, every a hundred uh, women have a have this problem. But if you look at the, the malignancy or other disorders, it is not the same incident. Same uh, the problem is very lower than low, lower than the other one, uh, and and and. Uh, of course, it is the secret life. No, no, no normally they they they, they, don't, they, uh, they don't want to talk about this. Uh, but if someone touched the, their shoulder, the the problem is coming coming after that. Uh, and we are t and they say they are they are, they are talking us with uh, the, this is the same in the, their mother. This is the same in their uh, the, the brother sister of the mother. So on. Uh, uh, of course, the laboratory issue is the, uh, the biggest problem. Everybody knows the uh, malignancy, and it's very easy to uh, to know the after the uh, stage one or stage two. Uh, but the bleeding disorders the depends needs needs a very, very comprehensive uh, laboratory, especially including uh, genetic analysis too. Thank you. I think we should keep on raising awareness on bleeding women. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad to hear that the Paula, this is the first <laughs> of your talks that you are talking about the bleeding in women. Maybe uh, we can continue this in different uh, uh, stages. Absolutely. So uh, are there, if there's any other questions? Uh, so as a last word, I will give hand to Burak to close the yeah, session sure. since there is no I have questions. a question actually. Ah, Nazla has a question, please, Nazla. Yes. Um, if uh, you have uh, talked about it, I couldn't get it, so I uh, will also ask this question. Nazla, we can't hear um, you. Can you put the microphone close to your mouth? Okay. Um, do we have a cure for this, um, for this disease? I couldn't get that. Mm. Uh, so, but um, if we have the cure, but enzyme or protein causes the stopping for bleeding in the diseases. So in terms of a cure for um, underlying bleeding disorders, right now the mainstay of treatment is to replace the protein that's missing. So in von Willebrand's disease, you would infuse von Willebrand factor concentrate. In hemophilia A or B, you would infuse factor eight or factor nine. There have been major advances though in the treatment, particularly of hemophilia. And we have some very novel treatments that Dr. Zulfikar talked about, um, such as emicizumab, which is a non-factor-based therapy um, that prevents bleeding. Gene therapy has been developed for the hemophilias and is available in clinical trials. So we are not clinically doing gene therapy outside of research trials right now. And I know that there are efforts to start trials for gene therapy for von Willebrand's disease, for the severe forms of von Willebrand's disease. And that would effectively be a cure. You transfer in, usually using viral vectors, the normal factor eight or factor nine gene one of the barriers, though, for gene therapy um, is that there can be complications. Sometimes it doesn't work well, and it's very expensive. And so a one-time treatment 
can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. But if you compare that to the lifetime of treating somebody, it, it may actually turn out to be cost effective. So a lot of this is still active and being researched right now. Uh, the, the, may I add, 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 uh, take a message for the woman? Uh, I think any woman who have uh, more than uh, seven days um, uh, menstruation and also uh, have uh, more than t twice of, uh, iron deficiency, they should go to the uh, hematologist for the uh, uh, for the analysis of the bleeding disorder to check it. Absolutely agree. And this is a very important take home message. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, for, you can. I think you can close the session because we are over the time. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Um, I am Burak as the vice president of Gene Aral Student Club. Um, I thank to the all speakers for their excellent talks, and I also thank to the Istanbul Aral University for supporting us to realize this event. Thank you all for joining us. The webinar has ended. Thank you, Paulus. Please pass my uh, love to everybody there. I will. Thank you. It was so nice to see you and so nice to meet all of you. Thank you for having thank me you. today. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.